Growing up, I enjoyed playing different board games. I don't know if anyone enjoyed playing those games. And, uh, you know, when, when you're little, the games are pretty simple, um, and you just want to win. And, well, one of my favorite games was actually Hungry Hungry Hippos, if you remember. Um, and it's just really loud, and parents are nodding and shaking their heads like this when they know what I'm talking about. Because you say go, and there's just little, these little things in the middle, and you're just hippos. You just hit the button as fast as you can, and you try to get all the things you can. And in order for you to get food, the person across the way has to not get food. Well, when I was a youth pastor, we, I thought it would be fun to play human Hunger, Hungry Hippos. So I, um, I gave teens helmets. So that's always good, right? Safety first. And then I bought a bunch of uh, furniture carts, and we tied rope to it, and we would fling students into the middle of the room. I don't know why I didn't think about that beforehand, that you fling teenagers at each other at the time, but, but it was good. We got ball pit balls, and um, ha- you know, we had laundry hampers, and they would try to collect them. We'd pull them back, and it was a good time. But um, and it all stemmed from just the idea of playing childhood games. Well, while Hungry Hungry Hippos makes for a great childhood game, it makes for an awful um, basis for relationships because I think some of us treat relationships like we'd play those childhood games. In the game, the goal is to get as much as you can, as fast as you can, and if you have to, take it from other people to get what you can. But in relationships, if you take that same mindset, if you enter every relationship thinking to yourself, what can I get from this? If you enter a room, if you enter a setting and you think to yourself, what can I get? What can I get? How can it benefit me? It, it ends up hurting you in the end. So over the next six weeks, we're going to talk about relationships because you don't have to be very churchy or even ever been a part of a church to desire to have good relationships, when you think about your spouse or your kids or your neighbor or your, your peer or a colleague or in your workplace or in your community, it's, we all desire to have stronger friendships and bonds and connection. And, and you might say that's not true, but I'm guessing in your mind right now, you're thinking of a person in your workplace that you wish would be hearing a series on relationships right now. All right, that's what we do. Even in listening, we tend to think to ourselves, oh, that would be really good for this person. Right? You're laughing because you have that person by name. Now, don't look at them if they're in the room. That's awkward. Okay? Okay, just look away. Now, don't look away completely. Now, they also, come on, you got you to gotta, you gotta be a little smoother when it comes. But, see, we all desire to improve our relationships, And I believe we've been given the picture and the model and the message of how to do that. Because if we love people like Jesus, like the God of the Bible, the the God of history as we know it, if we love people the way that Jesus loved people, I believe our relationships would change for the better. Now I enter this series fully recognizing that no one here, especially myself, has arrived. We all need to work on this. We all need to take that step. I believe that all of us intuitively know and understand that our relationships, how we treat people, could have a generational effect. And that while we intend to do things, a lot of times we, we miss the mark a little bit. And so knowing that we all have to improve and we all have to take that step, we're going to take a look over the next six weeks about practical areas where I believe if we apply them, if we live just a little bit more like Jesus, that I believe our relationships would radically change for the better. If you have your Bible, open up to Ephesians chapter 2. That's kind of towards the back half of the Bible. You can find the book of Ephesians in the table of contents or pull it up in your, your smart device or on the app there. And Ephesians is a letter written by a guy named Paul, and he wrote this to a church, and and Paul was put in prison because he was preaching about Jesus and about salvation and, and, and how to believe in God and who God is. And when he was put in prison, he was then, um, instead of just recognizing, well, I, I don't have ministry anymore, he actually started writing letters to churches. And so we have this letter, and he was writing to this church to, to see how they can actually apply the word of God. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, 
It actually talks about this thing called theology or the study of God. So it talks about how can you be saved, how you've been created on purpose and with a purpose, that you, you've been blessed to be a blessing, and it talks about grace and faith and all these big concepts. Well, then in chapter 4, he transitions and actually lands the plane, because, and that's our goal as this series moves on. We want to move from the inspirational and the aspirational to the tactical and the practical, because I believe everyone in this room knows the answer to, do you want to love people better? Right? I, don't, I don't think anyone's like, man, I really want to just hate people more. Like, I mean, that's what social media is for, right? So anyway, um, you know it's true. Come on. And so, um, and so here's the thing is that we all want, we want to love people better. So the question is not do we want to. The question is how. How can you love people better? Well, in Ephesians chapter 5, Verse 1 and 2, I'm going to read it, all to, um, read it straight through, and then we're going to break it down word for word. Okay, let's, let me go ahead and read the passage to you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So in two verses, you have a lot of stuff, okay? So let's just break this down. First word, therefore. If you're studying the Bible or you just read in general, and maybe in class you had a teacher say to you, if you see a therefore, you want to find out why it's there for. Okay? And so therefore is a buildup from the previous passages. And so earlier in the letter, Paul has talked about how you can be saved by grace through faith. That you can be adopted sons and daughters. And that God can do far more abundantly than anything you could ever ask, think, know, or dream. And that his love, God's love, is deeper than anything you can ever experience. So then he says you need to walk in a way, walk in a manner worthy of this love. And walk in a manner worthy of this truth. And so what he's saying, because God is love, because God gave his love, therefore, in light of all of this, in light of God's mercies, we can act a certain way. In other words, understanding the depth of God's love for you will help you reach the height of loving others. Understanding just how deep God's love for you really is actually will allow you to reach the height of loving others in your relationships. It says, therefore, the next phrase, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God. This is the idea that the word imitate literally means to mimic. And if you have young kids at home, it's super cute when you see them mimicking your moves. Now, if you ever see them mimic your moves in a negative way, that's a reflection back on yourself. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever seen a kid? Like, I remember I got excited, or, or I'll say excited, okay? I was frustrated at the TV because my team wasn't winning. All right, you maybe you've experienced, or maybe you're perfect, um, and you can be up here speaking. But um, so I was mad. My team was losing. I'm like, come on! And like, I'm just like, ah! Oh! And then... Little Carter, who at the time was like three, was like, come on, and like started shaking. He didn't even know what he was doing, right? And, uh, and he just started, stomped his foot and pu pumped his fist, and it was like, I'm like, yeah, okay, well, what is he doing? He was mimicking his father, okay? That's what we do as children is that we mimic or we do as Jesus does. And so we want to be imitators of God as beloved children, that idea of beloved children means two things. Number one, it gives us identity. It gives us value simply for existing. Don't miss that. We are created in the image of God and we're called sons and daughters of God. So as beloved children of God, that means that in order to be beloved, that you have a loving heavenly father. There are people in this room that have not had great healthy relationships and so it's difficult to view God as loving. And if you can't view God as loving, it can be more difficult to be loving towards others. And so by recognizing that we are beloved children, that our identity is secure in him, that allows us to move forward. But not only does it give us identity, it actually gives us the method through which we learn. Kids learn to speak how? By first doing what? Listening. 
right? You don't have a child that just starts speaking full, in full language, right? They, they listen, and over time, as they listen, they start to mimic or repeat and, and start speaking phrases and pretty soon start communicating on their own. In the same way, as beloved children, they give us identity, but are also the method through which we can learn to love like God. When we listen and we look for how God first loved us. But then notice the next phrase. So as beloved children, to walk in love. So it's both our identity, but then our challenge, to walk in love. And I love that concept of walk in love because that's a pace you can sustain. Right? That's a pace you can sustain. Multiple times, actually, through this letter, he, he uses the phrase walk. He says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling, or walk in light. This concept of walking, I also love it because it simply means wherever you are, no matter how far away you are from God, walking starts with a single step. Some of you in your relationships right now, you don't know what's going to happen Two weeks, two months, two years, 20 years down the road. But you know what you could do today, right now, to take a step forward in that relationship. So you walk in love is that you take love with you in each step. The other thing I love about the idea of walking is that it involves all that you are. You can't just have part of your body walking, right? It doesn't work like, like oh, yeah. You know, how you doing today, John? Good. My left leg went for a walk. That's foolish, right? Like, oh, hey. Right? Like, this, this looks ridiculous, right? But some of us, this is how we live the Christian life. We're like, okay, God, I'm going to give you this day. I'm going to give you this time. I'm going to do this one thing. Don't ask about my right leg, God. That's mine, okay? But I'm, right? And then... Spiritually speaking, we wonder why we feel dizzy at the end of the day. Well, you're walking in a circle. Like, walking involves taking all of you with you. And he gives you the power because your identity is secure. So as a beloved child, you enter that space. If you, if you love, like, presidential history, um, I love the old pictures in the Oval Office where a president is making really important decisions, and then you see the child running into the room. Right, or, or hiding under the desk, if you know what I'm talking about. Well, the only person that has that access to the leader of the free world is actually the child of that leader. In the same way, we have direct access to God, and so we are beloved children, so therefore we can walk, take a step in all that we are in love towards others. But then it says, well, how do we walk? Well, we walk as Christ loved us, and so notice he's going to describe how he loved us. He loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his son. So he gave up his life for our life. He took on our punishment. He took on our hurts, our doubts, everything. He took on all those things so that we could receive his blessing, his strength, his power, his love and the inheritance, and reign with God. So he gave himself up. In Romans 5.8, it says, while we were still sinners. In other words, it's not like we, we really put this great petition together, like if you're at work and you gotta make a sales pitch or a proposal. Like we didn't, we didn't create a, a keynote presentation or PowerPoint presentation. Well, God, let me give you the reasons why you should adopt us as sons and daughters. No, we've, if anything, we've given God every possible reason to reject us, but yet it says, while we were sinners, while we still rejected God, that he died for us. And so he gave himself up for us, and this idea of a fragrant offering ties back to an Old Testament concept of where um, when they would sacrifice animals, this, this, this fragrance or um, that they would have this aroma to, one, practically speaking, cover the aroma of animal sacrifice, okay? But then, two, it was supposed to be pleasing to God. And people who didn't believe in the God of the Bible, even other religions would give offerings, and they'd say, well, this is, aroma is pleasing to others. As humans, we love that. That's why we love, um, you know, air fresheners. We love, like, if you love getting in a car that just got a fresh air freshener in it, right? It's great. And so that's why products like Febreze, 
are in business because we want to cover the bad smells with the good smells. And so this idea of how can a sacrifice actually be a fragrant offering, it's because it brings blessing. And so it brings blessing. So he gives him, and then actually it talks about when you would bring a sacrifice in the Old Testament, you would take it to the altar. So this place where you're asking God for forgiveness and laid down. But what Jesus did was that he himself became the sacrifice for us or the payment for our sins. So Jesus Christ, his sacrifice became pleasing to God because it brought us back in tune or in connection with him. And so even today, I love this picture. I never really thought about the connection until just prepping for the sermon this week. But we always call the front place of where a wedding ceremony is happening, we call that what? You know, I'm meeting you at the altar, right? Well, why do you do that? It's because you have a couple that has actually agreed to sacrifice their lives for each other to God to bless one another. So this picture of an altar is one of sacrifice, but sacrifice for the purpose of blessing. Now, if that sounds super churchy and things to you, uh, let me just put it to you a different way. Um, A guy named Eugene Peterson just passed away. He's seen as like one of the giants of the faith. He was faithful um, and just preached and wrote amazing things. He actually paraphrased the entire Bible and what's now known as the message. And, And he actually writes it this way. He actually says this in the message from Eugene Peterson. He says in there, he says, watch what God does and then you'll do what, and then you'll do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious but extravagant. And he didn't love in order to get something from us, but he gave everything of himself to us. So love like that. So if you're taking notes, write this down. That loving like Jesus isn't efficient. It's extravagant. Loving like Jesus is not efficient. It's extravagant. Isn't it amazing that in a day and age where everything is faster and faster and faster and faster, but yet we don't have more time? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, I I remember even, like, it doesn't seem that long ago where you would hear that little dial-up for internet, right? Or you just see the word buffering. And now it's like if my page doesn't load up, even if I'm in the middle of nowhere on my phone, if it doesn't load up in, like, two seconds, I get frustrated. Anyone with me on that? Right? Or even times before internet when you actually had to know stuff. (laughs) Right? And you had things like maps, and encyclopedias and dictionaries, and you had to actually know phone numbers, right? And things like that. Now we don't know anything because, oh, I'll just ask Siri or Google it, right? But notice that we have all these technologies now, but somehow we have not gained any time. Because it's not so much time management as it is life management. And, and whether, you ha- whether you spend it well or not, the next day, you don't gain anything from the previous. And so you have to make better life choices and manage your choices. And you can choose to love. And so love is not efficient. You can't take a toddler and say, well, I'm going to change your diaper at this time. I'm going to do this at this time. And then we're going to be able to go. No. If you have to get out of the house... That's when they lose their shoes. If you have to be at a meeting, that's when they spit up over your outfit, right? If, if you are going on vacation, that's when you leave the, all the chargers at home, right? Or that's when you're going to get called. That's what, like, but you, can, you don't have the option. You're like, nope, I'm not going to change the diaper. Right now. Nope, doesn't count. That wasn't on my schedule, right? But why do you do that? Because you love them. And so love is not efficient. It's extravagant. It goes above and beyond. But there are barriers to loving well. And so one of the, um, one of the things we want to talk about today is this concept of being mindful. Being mindful. So you can define mindful as being observant or focused or attentive. Another dictionary puts it this way, that um, it's to express affectionate interest through close observation in gallant gestures. I love that word gallant. I just saw it. I was like, wow, I haven't 
seen that word in a long time. So it means brave or like extravagant, right? To be mindful is to be aware. But we're not always aware. And sometimes it's by choice and other times it's not there. So uh, actually I want to show you a video. I'm going to test your awareness right now. Okay, I want to test your counting ability. Some of you are starting to practice counting in your head to remind yourself how to count, but that's okay. Um, and so this was a test done back in 1999. They've redone it a couple times, but I want you to test your counting. I want to test your attentiveness nature and just see how, how mindful this group is right here. So go ahead and let's check out this video. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? Okay. For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. So th that is the attention test. Just, um how many who hadn't seen it before actually spotted the gorilla? Anyone, okay, did anyone willing to admit they did not see the gorilla? Okay, yeah, it was about half the room, which is a, every test they've ran, it's about 50%. Um, and for those that knew the test, did you catch the curtain changing or that the player left? No. And so like, oh, I got this. And it's true in life too, right? As soon as you think you know something, you're like, oh, I got this. And we miss so much, right? We miss so much. Well, here's the truth when it comes to, this is called perceptual blindness, or times where something right in front of us we miss. Uh, there is physical blindness, but then there's also spiritual blindness. And so something can happen right in front of us, and we miss it. But luckily, we have a God, Jesus, who actually heals blindness, in, in John chapter 9, we don't have time to read it today, but actually a whole story where, where Jesus heals a blind man. In Mark chapter 8, verse 18, he talks about how, how can you have eyes, but yet you do not see, referring to spiritual blindness. But then in Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31, it says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And so this idea of being mindful is one of attention. But here's the problem. Sometimes we miss stuff, right? And so I believe that the biggest barrier to being attentive is our own agenda. The biggest barrier to being attentive is our own agenda. In other words, what's your immediate goal? What is it that you had on plan for today or in this moment or in this conversation or this project? In your growth groups this week, you're going to actually spend time talking about um, either a story about a guy named Zacchaeus or about what's known as the Good Samaritan. You're talking about one of those or maybe even both. And so, but for right now, I want to just talk about this idea of what keeps people from actually experiencing something great. A few years ago, a world-renowned violinist, his name is Joshua Bell. Joshua Bell um, can, play, can play Bach, can play all these things. He actually, he's so well-known that he actually purchased a, um, a violin, a Stradivari um, violin, 
made from the 1700s for $3.5 million, seen as like the perfect violin from the world's top violin player. And so they did this social experiment. Just a few days prior, he sold out a symphony hall for over $100 a ticket in Boston to play some of the most incredible pieces ever written in the entire world on this $3.5 million violin. Well, a few days later, they actually took him in disguise to a a subway station in Washington, D.C. And there, outside the subway station, he played for 45 minutes. Within those 45 minutes, a 1,000 people passed in front. So what people played hundreds of dollars for, to watch for two to three hours just a few days prior, people had access to and got to walk face to face and, and, and just super close and listen firsthand. The most beautiful music played in the world, played on a three and a half million dollar violin by one of the most talented musicians in the entire world. Now out of a thousand people that entered that station, do you know how many actually stopped to listen even for a minute? Seven people. Seven people. Almost a thousand people missed one of the world's greatest musicians playing some of the greatest music on one of the most expensive instruments right in front of them. Why? Because they had a place to go, someone to meet, something to do, and they weren't looking for it. I think we do the same thing. We get so focused on what we have to get done that we miss who we're supposed to love and minister to. A couple years ago, when my wife were looking to buy a car, we decided on a Honda Civic. She was doing home health at the time, and so she was traveling around. We wanted something dependable, and we wanted something uh, with good gas mileage. And so it was funny. I was like, man, yeah, let's get a, a white Honda Civic. It's like, I don't see those anywhere. Guess what I saw and still see to this day? Everywhere we go, white Honda Civic. Every. Like every day I see these, why? Because I'm now mindful of it. In fact, I've told some of you this before, I had that embarrassing moment where I was meeting with students and as guys meet, we kid and give each other a hard time. I was meeting in Josh and Joey Step and we were talking, I was giving them a hard time, like ha I clicked the button to my car, I got in, I turned the key and it wasn't starting. And I'm like, wow, this car's cleaner than I remember. <laughs> I had gotten into the wrong Honda Civic parked next to me and tried to start it in front of my students. And so they watched as I had to get out of the car, (laughs) close it, still looking at them, go one over, get in the car, (laughs) drive away. So now, once I started looking for white Honda Civics, did they all of a sudden magically appear? No, I just started becoming mindful of that and I started to notice that. I believe the same thing is true when we look for moments to love others well. And so even in just preparation for this message, I just said, okay, God, I'm going to commit this week. And it's crazy how God works. It's like I was trying to prep a sermon about being mindful and I kept getting interrupted. And so at first I was like, God, I'm trying to finish this sermon on paying attention to you, and I keep getting phone calls, and I was like, this is sounding ridiculous. Okay, hello, hi, yeah. And so I started calling, and literally every single day, I had a surprise conversation that ended up having a spiritual component, and I got to offer encouragement to someone. Now, I think that was God, but I also think that was me being open and being mindful or receptive to doing that. Because here's the second thing I want you to write down, is that Compassion lives at the corner of mindfulness and action. Compassion lives at the corner of mindfulness and action. If you're looking for a house or you're trying to to order pizza and they they want to bring something to you, they're, okay, what are the cross streets, right? Because here in Arizona, I learned when I first moved here that um, Joe Max and 70th Street is a lot different than Joe Max and 70th Avenue, Right? For those that might be watching this online, the roads in Arizona is on the east side of Central. It's street on the west side. It's avenue, and it kind of counts up. And some of you are just learning this for the first time. It's okay. Take notes. That's good. Um, And so you need both streets to find the location of the house. One doesn't cut it. Well, in the same way, if you want to be compassionate, you have to have mindfulness. You have to actually be aware of the need, but then you actually have to take action 
to meet that need. So what does that look like? Well, a couple just recommendations here. Number one, James 1.5 tells us that you can ask for wisdom. Ask God to give you the eyes to see. Number two, start to look for what's beneath the surface, right? You have a conversation with that coworker, but try to see, okay, what's actually underneath that? Number three, listen for what's not said, right? If you're having a conversation, listen, listen for what their body language is communicating, but is not fully verbalizing to you. And then number four, just take a small action. And I, guys, I'm, I'm trying to learn this myself. Just, just a phone call, a, a text, a meal. A, just, just take that step to show that you care and that you love and that their need is more important than your own agenda for a moment. And then we can start to be mindful. And the more you start to become aware of that, it changes things. You know, I thought, to be honest with you, I thought I trusted God, and then I tried to start a church. <laughs> it's like, no, I trust God, and then this whole thing started, and like so many times, I've been so stressed out on so many issues, and then I finally realized this, this is true, okay? Our job is to build people, and God's job is going to be to build the church. We build people, we live lives, we love others well, and God will build his church. And it starts by being mindful of him. 